Well, hi, I'm Doreen Heater, uh, children's pastor at Northwest Family Church in Auburn, Washington, humbly serving Jesus for more than 25 years. I love him very much, and I love it that when kids come to know Jesus. But what I love even more is when entire families are rocking it for Jesus. And so today I want to share a little bit about some learning discovery, learning things and things I've discovered along the way that really have helped parents. Um, because parents are first and foremost the front line of children's ministries. And uh, we need to partner with them, even the ones that are absent. And how can we do that? So we're going to unpack that a little bit today. So let's pray real quick, and then I'm going to jump in and give my ideas. God, thanks so much. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for imparting, Lord God, a calling and a place for us, Lord, to serve you. I ask, dear Jesus, that you would help each person that's here to empower, Lord God, their leaders and their parents, Lord, uh, to catapult for greater um, longevity of, uh, Lord God, of your mission, kind of like, like ripple effects, God, throughout the children and families' lives. Father, I just pray for that. I pray for uh, a harvest that's plentiful and bountiful, God. I just ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help each person here to not ever give up doing good, Lord, and not ever lose hope in the hope that uh, you've placed inside of us, Lord Jesus, that they would continue, Father, even when times are tough and it's difficult, not comfortable, God. I just pray that you would help each person here, Lord, to keep continually taking up the challenge that you've given us and the calling God because you've already equipped us to do the thing you called us to do God so I'm so thankful for that bless this time I pray in your name amen amen well spiritual formation that's that's a big word that basically um, can be defined as a, a lifelong process of becoming more like Jesus <laughs> that's really the the basis of what uh, spiritual formation um, um, is and our goal as a children's department children's minister leader children's team is to help parents partner with parents to discover how they can help uh, the spiritual formation of their kids um, and I I know that um, each child is on a different journey and each family is on a different journey with Jesus so it's basically helping them to take one small step closer to Jesus every day um, of their lives and how to uh, measure that so we have to have goals right so we we just don't want boom it's going to happen that they're going to grow spiritually right so there has to be intentionality um, a part of the parents it has to be intentionality a part of us but oftentimes I don't know if you've ever had a teacher meeting or, or parent excuse me a pe parent meeting and they're like uh-huh uh-huh and they're overwhelmed uh, with uh, this sense of guilt. I've even seen that a lot in parents. Um, they're, they're feeling guilty. They're run out of time. They're really busy. They don't feel like they can connect with their kids. Um, they don't want to really talk about spiritual things like, well, I just trust the church to do that. I've, I've encountered all of those different things. Um, they really see sometimes us as babysitters, and we're really trying to be ministers, you know, and impart the truth uh, to their kids. So I, I've seen all those spectrums, and I just want to give you some hope. Um, hope in making a difference in the children's lives uh, that are before you and the parents that are there. Um, and I also know that spiritual formation is a lifelong process. So it's not um, one defined moment of you know, salvation, right? Uh, that is when they make him their savior. But what we really want to produce is children that make him Lord. That's what we really want. We really don't want good kids. We want godly kids. So how do we do that? Um, and how do we become more like Jesus? And what are the measurable moments in a child's life? Are there measurable moments in a child's life? And I would say yes. Um, there are measurable moments that define the growth process and how we can ensure children are making spiritual progress. Um, and I love some of the books that Barna has put out. If you have not read them, you need to read them. They really challenge the cutting edge of of children's ministries and the fact that um, we make excuses on behalf of well not all the parents are here or we can't expect parents to do it um, it's kind of like telling them saying the no first before you really equip them and see with the results so I want to challenge that thinking a little bit 
Yes, there are unsaved kids that come off the street in our children's ministries. There are in mine. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But I really believe the majority have a parent. And how can we invest in the parents to help them to raise their kids? And uh, if you're not already familiar with Deuteronomy 6, it's the passage and the narrative there describe the fact that the parent is, is the primary resource for raising their kids. Um, it, they are the key to leading children to grow spiritually. And we also see naturally that the spiritual foundation of a child is developed when it's young. Um, there's a book out that says, everything I learned, I learned by kindergarten. And really, that's age five or six, that kids learn morals, values, their faith base by a young age. Doesn't, doesn't mean that older kids can't learn and find Jesus. We, we know that to be true. God's greater than that. But if we can take a child when they're very young, and we can start creating measurable moments for them, they will grow spiritually. And that's what we really uh, want to challenge ourselves to do. And I do believe that the home is the front line of introducing Jesus to their kids. Um, I have a nursery coordinator. She's really passionate. She has a boatload of kids, like a lot of kids. I can't even remember. I think it's eight or nine uh, kids that she's had, right? Nine? Eight? Ten. That's right. Ten. <laughs> I know it's a lot. She's had ten kids, and her, late, and her last one was a surprise, but a wonderful surprise. And little Hannah just came into kids' church last month. Oh, I got her five-year-old. I remember when she was born, and now she's five. She's smarter than I'll get out. And she said, we were in the car. We're just listening to Jesus' music. She had gone through you know, preschool and everything and had yet to make a decision for Jesus Christ. She was, uh, it was the month just before entering kids' church. She's driving in the car, and she said, Mom... Uh, it was a, like a question like, how is God real? Or is God, you know, love me? Or that type of thing. And Lee kind of proceeded just to take that moment and share the ABCs of salvation with her. You know, you have to acknowledge that, you, you know, you needed Jesus and you need a Savior. And, everything. and she led her kid to the Lord right there in the van. And the little girl goes, I now belong to a big family mom. Like, she's just all smart and everything. Tell her, like, they've been teaching me all along that, I, that God made us and we're a part of his family and all this stuff. And, um, and now she's so confident. And here's the cool thing. So for the last two months, I've seen this little kid in our kids' church. Her, her mom just helps her with scripture and teaches her, teaches her. Te like, I can just really see that parent really engaged in this child. And a lot of times when you give a salvation call, how many of you have kids that continually raise their hand for salvation, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a process, right? A lot long journey. And I don't deny that they're inviting, perhaps again in their mind, the Lord to, into their heart again. But the truth is that he doesn't leave, right? So salvation is that moment experience. What they're probably dealing with is conviction of sin or I want to make sure I'm going to heaven, assurance of salvation or heaven, right? And um, Hannah has yet to re-raise her hand. She's never raised her hand again. And I just turned to Lee on our journey over here, and I said, Lee, thank you. I said, you have instilled and invested in her. She knows two or three scriptures. Um, she quotes them to me. I know I'm a child of God. And I said, she has no doubt with simple two or three scriptures and a parent that keeps telling her, you don't, you're saved. So she now, in a little five-year-old, has already acknowledged that and whenever we have the salvation, which is usually every Sunday I'm giving an altar call, she doesn't raise her hand. She'll raise her hand about other things because I always give two altar little messages or whatever, you know, responses. And I didn't even process it until I turned to Lee and I said, Hannah has never double raised her hand. She's never raised her hand. She, she knows that she's saved. That's what I'm talking about. Could we do that in more kids' lives? I believe that we can. And... It is also true that this responsibility rests on the parents. However, the church must partner with. I really believe the, par the parents must partner with and assist parents to help them. Parents flounder. Even me as a parent I have two kids, 19 and 16. Kids do not come with a manual. Every child is different. Every child sees God differently. <laughs> it's like, ah! I wish every kid was the same. And we can't teach to the same, right? We can't teach the same. So what I have found that um, even as a parent, that I have to have encouragement. <laughs> I have to feel like I'm, I'm making a difference in my child life. And so sometimes our role is cheerleader. You are making a difference. How many uh, know like a preschool parent? They need to hear it 10 times as much, right? They feel like they're failures. Because every day they're either going to lose it, they're going to, you know, because you can't, you know, preschoolers, they're just like, I thought I was going to lose my mind. I went to mops just so I could have one hour to myself. And I was a 
is pastor. And I just like knew that if I struggled as a parent, can you imagine other people who don't have a degree or background or even church background? So we have a lot of people coming to our church because of the return of people coming to church that never were raised in church. They've never seen it. They don't know how to raise their kids. So how do we encourage them? How do we love on parents who have never seen how to, how to do this? So the church has got a partner. We've got to be their biggest cheerleaders. And we've got to assist parents and equip them to do it. Our goal is to guide families as they grow in their relationship with Jesus. I put a little note right there in your paper. This does not mean that the child that comes to church without parents will not be able to grow. I, I don't believe that. I believe either some other parents are going to intervene. I believe that God's going to use you, other teachers, the church as a whole to be the parent in that. In, it's kind of like called, I call it parent substitution, <laughs> that someone else is going to be that role for them if not a parent that's, fit, that's spiritually a part of their life. We need to trust that kids attending church will grow as we aid and match them up to other parents, grandparents, um, other kids um, in our church. In fact, I have one mom, her name is Tina, and she never comes to church in an empty van. She goes through her neighborhood, she's constantly inviting, and somehow they just magnetize to her. And I said, you have the gift of evangelism, Tina. Anybody you invite comes. And these kids and parents, and she's leading, and they're coming to church. She started working at a vet. And the boss and her husband started coming. They started attending a small group before they even got saved. And, her, and their dad and the little kid came to my first parent meeting, which is a little bit what I'm going to give you some supply for. And she goes, we need to buy a Bible. We need a Bible, I think. <laughs> when he came up to me, I'm like, yes, you need a Bible for your child. He goes, I don't own a Bible. Do I need a Bible? <laughs> I'm like, yes, you do. And I think that that is contagious through other people. So fan the flames of the people that are evangelists in your, in your department and match them up with kids that are coming solo. Okay? So the task of partnering with parents can be challenging as a leader. Um, I often see kids, um, you know, ministry being treated like a babysitting service happens to me. Um, and I think that's sometimes our own attitude. So we got to throw our bad attitude out and say, and so I tell pastor, anybody's doing it, hey, will you provide child care? I say, no, but I'll provide children's ministries for you. And they're like, oh, well, that, you know, that's what I meant. Yeah, that's what I mean, too. <laughs> I'm like, I'll provide ministry for your kids, not babysitting. Um, and yes, yeah, sometimes it is just child care, but I don't see it as that. I always see it as an opportunity to bless kids and parents so that they can hear about Jesus. So teaching our parents to take the spiritual lead role is often hard and uh, challenging at best. And I've experienced it when we provided a training in the past or an event. Parents, like I'd have three or four parents out of 180 kids. I'm thinking, do they not care? So then, you know, I was saying the no for them. They're too busy. Don't say the no for them and don't make excuses for them. Hound after them and continue to cheer them on and cheerlead them on um, and over communicate. And I think perhaps my, some of my fallacies are all of those things that um, I didn't over communicate, that I didn't tell them how valuable it was, that I didn't provide breakfast. Now I provide a big buffet breakfast. They come to that, which is really cool. It, you know, whatever you have to do to get them there, right? And so, um, and I do it during the, the first hour of church. So we have two services. I do it during a time they're already bringing their kids. I tell them, come in. This is your volunteer time at the first hour, and then you can sit in service a second. They do it. It's just, it, it turned out. And those little uh, experiments that we had instead of long meetings or meetings that were boring um, changed it, and we call it parent preview. And we just give them a preview, and we tell, I tell them, you're going to meet the leaders, you're going to hear the children's pastor's heart, and I'm going to give you a teachable moment. I'm going to give you a tool uh, to help navigate uh, spiritual formation of your kids. So you're not going to want to miss out, and I'm going to give away some free Bibles. I just, just love on them, because I just figure I'm resourcing parents and encouraging them. And so we saw a complete turn of three parents coming to now nearly 40 or 50 parents coming over the course of a quarter. So I try to offer it. I was offering it only once a year. I'm trying to offer it three times a year um, so that I give updates and talk about camp and all that kind of stuff. And I just give them an, an hour, sometimes interaction, Q&A, and a tool. I never let them leave without a tool. And I always encourage them in that. So here are some key ideas that I give away. So I want to give you some tools. 
books, uh, not just philosophy, because I believe you're probably believing what I believe, right? Like, I want to encourage parents, but Doreen is the hardest thing. So here are some things that I want to, some tools I want to give you. So the first thing that I uh, communicate to parents is that faith activities are at home and along the way. Um, that they can do these in the car. Um, Deuteronomy 6, you know, says along the way, when they go to bed, when they rise up, when they're eating their cereal and their Cheerios, or when they're heading out to school. Actually, it's teachable moments all throughout the day. So the first thing is I say, start devotions when they're young. Um, encourage devotions, not hours and hours of something, little baby bite-sized steps. I said, if you have a preschooler, do this. So I give them ideas. I use personal stories with them and tell them how I've either done it with my kids or see other parents do it. Um, I talk about a Bible reading for their kids, helping them to love the Bible. In fact, in our pre-K pre classes, I tell my teachers I want them to kiss the Bible and hug the Bible and sing the B-I-B-L-E and tell them how much the Bible is important to their everyday life. The Bible is the foundation of everything. Run to the Bible for answers, look up scriptures, hold your Bible, hold your Bible, hold your Bible, use your Bible, read your Bible, and then eventually they're going to want to read it with you. Memorize scriptures together. Um, and then second, pray with them. Pray about things that matter to the kids. I just say simply, you know, instead of, I, I, I didn't just say wrote prayers, you know, now I lay me down to sleep or all that stuff. I just asked my kids, what are you expecting from God? What do you need from God? What would you like to thank God about? And I allowed them to pray. I would model it. Oh, I don't know what to say, Mom. I'd coach them in a prayer. Just like you would your kids, you'd coach them in a salvation prayer. I started doing that in the home. And I found the result was they know how to pray. My kids don't hesitate when I say, would you like to pray over dinner? Okay. You know, teenagers, they kind of roll your eyes. All right. You know, but they know how. <laughs> and what's really cool is that I, I'm just telling the parents, this is how you do it. Little step at a time. This is how you do it. So give them teaching moments on prayer. I ask them to invest in devotional books, spiritual investment. I ask them buy stuff. And then I bring this whole table of these Bibles and how-to how parenting books. The number one parenting book that I absolutely, absolutely love that I give to every parent upon dedication is Shepherding a Child's Heart. I really recommend that book to parents. It helps them to navigate um, preschool life especially and, and beyond. Um, and give, give, give away stuff. Talk to them a little bit about websites that you would approve and that you've looked at. Um, make sure that you've previewed them totally. And I give them a list of websites. I even had the parent say, there's the Bible app. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And so I help them Bible apps and kids apps because, the, you know, the phone's always with them. So I give them not just Bib Bibles or book stuff. I give them applications and websites and all sorts of things. Um, encourage parents to provide simple um, memory verses that they can start out um, with. So, um, you know, we do ta how many do take-home paper still? Like you send something home, refrigerator, magnet, something. We send something home with them, right? So how many of you think that those make it somewhere? Okay, so instead of being discouraged about it, be proactive and send an email. Like how many have like, if you have a database or you have your Excel spreadsheet, send home to the parents the next six weeks of lessons or something. Tell them in advance the scriptures and challenge them and give them an idea. What can you do with this first? So I started doing that. I started just giving little po postcards or I'd send home the cards with an activity. If they sign it and the parents sign it and they bring it back, they get a token or a prize or a sticker or whatever it was. And the parents are like, well, we had a great discussion over that book or that question you had just by simply small little rewards. And we're really training them to do it on their own, not just for a reward, but we want to teach parents how to do it and get excited about it for their kids. So we encourage um, parents to follow up and use the paperwork, but we, if you can communicate in advance instead of after. So if you can do it before, then after. This is the series we're going to do. I'm not always perfect at it, but it is my goal to send an email out. Hey, we're going to be talking about three weeks about finance. Um, just wanted to let you, give you guys a heads up. I always pre-communicate about uh, ordinance of the church, like if we're going to do communion or any of that, um, letting them know, removing any fears or barriers with parents. Um, but also, um, I'm going to get back to my outline here, Re 
encourage parents to read scriptures together and talk about them. Not just to read them, but to actually talk about them. That's a, a key thing, is to say, well, how does that apply to us? Or what do you think that means? Um, it's what they call in school reading comprehension. And I learned a cool tip from a kindergarten teacher. She said, reading comprehension is asking three questions. It's asking them what they see in the passage. It's asking them what do they see will happen as a result. Or it's looking at a picture and saying, what else could happen? It's really some cool things. I'm like, what? That's reading comprehension. Like, what else could happen? I'm helping them to see outside of just that scripture. Um, on Wednesday night, just this last weekend, Jam Street, we have a little thing called Jesus and Me Street. It's our club on Wednesday night. And the kids came and I said, tell me what the scripture says about God. There were six qualities about God in one scripture verse. And I got them all excited. I said, we're going to be on fire for reading the Bible. I said, tell me what one thing is. And then they went to scripture. Well, he knows everything. He sees everything. He knows our heart. Or, and then I said, and then if you seek him, you will find him. So God can be found. And, and they were like getting all excited about these six. How many? So count them. And they're counting them. And at the end of it, I said, now, can you imagine if you read one scripture every day, just one scripture, and asked yourself, where is God in this verse? Or what is the quality of God in this verse? Can you imagine if we helped our parents just to do that? Where is God in this verse? What is he like? What does he say we should do? So those are those reading comprehensions. The second thing, kind of alluded to earlier, is teachable moments. Um, help parents see the need to be with their children daily. This is the number one tool I believe the enemy uses against parents and kids and families. Social media, phone, apps, da blah, 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 blah. I'm not talking about you, you learning apps or anything like that. I'm not against anything like that. I use my phone. But often I'll see kids at a playground and their parents are here. Often I'll see kids in a, a learning environment and the adults are on their phone. I, I believe this is one thing. There's lots of distractions, of course, in this world. But if you could help them to be present. Um, my husband uh, read a wonderful book, um, and I'm uh, alluding the title right now. Um, on, It'll come to me here in a minute. And he said the one premise of the book, the peaceful, uh, something warrior, peaceful warrior, something like that. And it was a non-religious book that had a lot of religious tones in it, like a not, not, not Christian book. And he said the one thing that it said, the, the, it was like a social kind of thing. He said the one thing it said is the author um, was challenging this Olympic uh, person. He had lost this race or gotten injured, and he had this long recovery. And so he was challenging him, kind of like Socrates or something. And he said, he goes, so where are you right now? Because the guy gave up. He don't want, I, don't want to, I don't want to compete. He says, where are you right now? He says, well, I'm, I'm here in New York. He goes, well, no, where are you right now? He goes, well, I'm here in New York standing on this building. He says, well, where are you right now? And he says, well, I'm in New York standing on this building with you. He says, where are you right now? And the guy said, I'm right here. And he says, now you're here. He says, now you're here. You're right here in the moment. You're standing here, not thinking about anything else. I have seen my many kids come up, Mom, I'm Dad, Dad, and they want to tell them that, oh, later, later, later. And I think that kids, the busyness of kids and the busyness of parents, they keep waiting for the next day to engage in that spiritual conversation. So I always tell parents, and I had parents crying. <laughs> They're like, what? And I said, how many teachable moments did you miss because you were so busy or absorbed in something else to not be with your kids? Be present with your kids. Um, and I have a wonderful um, thing that I found on the fatherprint.com by the Rosenbergs. And I put it on the screen. I'll have it here on the screen. It's on your outline there called Lead Them. And it basically outlines the word. It's an acronym, Lead Them, if you look at them down ways. How to be present with your kids. Ever, you know, just right to be in the moment. Love them, encourage them, ask them questions about their day. I always open in a question, don't ever ask a yes or no question. Don't, don't, don't do that. And uh, discipline them, don't shy away from the, from the discipline, even if the world says, oh, if you do that, don't shy away from it. Um, dis discipline takes many forms, not just punishment. So choice are a good way to teach your kids how to grow responsibility. Next, train them. Train your child not just how to do things, but the why. Teach them the why they do that. Um, teach them the spiritual belief behind it. 
They learn more from actions than words. Have fun with them. So when's the last time you did something fun with your kids? You know, just fun. Like, no agenda. Um, I even suggested, hey, everybody leave your technology in the basket at home, and we're heading to the park. No interference. No agenda. Like, um, I, I also challenge parents, just plan something short and simple. We're going to go to the mall, or we're going to go do this, or we're going to bake cookies and take it to our elderly neighbor. Like, it can be any kind of activity that you get. you're teaching them. All these teachable moments if they're in present with them and they can have fun doing it they follow we all often tell our, our leaders at camp hey how passionate you are is how passionate your kids are going to be it's the same with parents it's kind of like being on a worship team and I, i'm looking right here. <laughs> no like on the worship team you have to do it at 150 percent and then maybe they'll do it at 70 right and it's the same with parenting you have to be wholeheartedly passionate about jesus having fun with your kids be engaged at that 150% level, which is tiring, hard work, but is it worth it? It's worth it when your kids love and follow Jesus. So that's why I tell parents. And then I equip, equip, uh, equip the kids. Have parents equip their own kids for success. A lot of people don't think, what's success? Success is buying them the new Bible for the next thing, making sure that they have access to Christian things or scriptures or any of that. Um, help your children to understand that, that they are good and provide them with guidance and how they can develop their strengths and weaknesses. So like spiritual gifting tests for kids, all sorts of fun things that helping them discover their identity and who they are in Jesus Christ. And the last is motivate them. Um, I encourage parents to teach their kids how to set goals, even spiritual goals for their own life. So next year, when you're seven, what would you like to accomplish for God? What kind of conversations. Do we have those conversations? I challenge parents to have those conversations with their kids. Um, um, if your and then the children often get rewarded for good behavior. And if they are, they'll be inclined to repeat that behavior. Um, how many give away prizes or goodies or anything for anything at your church? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do too. I'm resistant sometimes. I get a lot of flack sometimes too. If you give away candy, the dentist, you know, he hounds you. And I just tell them I do it randomly and I do it so that the children will be motivated. I said, because what I'm trying to do is develop a habit in them. Um, so I'm open to suggestions. I always say, I'm open to suggestions. How would you like to motivate the kids? And sometimes they come up with some pretty creative ideas that I've implemented, implemented over the years. I've given out wooden tokens that they could shop at a store and all sorts of things. Motivate our kids uh, to follow Jesus and be present with them. Be present with them. The third thing, this is uh, something that God just kind of laid on my heart that I kind of created a system in our church. It's called Celebrating Spiritual Milestones. Um, how many of you have a trophy or something that's in your cabinet or on your wall? Um, some of you might not be parents, but like when your kid does artwork, you put it on the refrigerator. Or if they, they win their soccer game, they get a trophy. And we place those in big priority or whatever. Or if the Seahawks win a game, we're like, you know, we got their poster up there and everything. And how many of you have any kind of certificate, award, or something that you've celebrated spiritually? in your child's life or helped parents to celebrate. There are missed moments because we don't celebrate spiritual things. We only celebrate the world's things. We only say, look at that trophy. That's, that's your success. That's your identity. No, it's not. The trophies are not. I felt so convicted. Like my, kid, uh, my kids wanted to be in certain things. And we set a big boundary. We said, we want you to choose one sport, not all of them. We want you to choose something that doesn't interfere with church. We want you to choose um, events or things. And even now, uh, my youngest son's in marching band, pep band, and the elite band. And, we, and whenever it comes in conflict with something, we just say, we have made a choice and a commitment to follow Jesus first. This is a priority. There's a few rare times where we'll allow them to do something that's really big. But overall, we just let the coach know in advance. And we say, you know what, all these things, but this is the date that I know that my son won't be here because uh, he has a commitment. He's on the worship team for church. He's, you know, um, Unless it's something really big like graduation, we're, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're setting a boundary for him. And I think that we often... Um, celebrate all of those cool things 
and we celebrate our football teams and all sorts of things way more than we celebrate the spiritual milestones in our kids' lives. Um, so parents of our, at our church, so I created a little uh, certificate thing out there. Uh, on the way out, you can grab any of the resources I brought. One is a, a certificate of milestone. I created three or four of them. Um, and I encourage parents to spiral bind them, frame them, create a scrapbook. And um, whenever a child accomplishes one of the milestones, fill it out, bring it to me, I'll sign them, or I'll sign 15 early, or whatever you need to do. If you want it signed by me, or Pastor Garen, or anything, child's dedication, I sign one for them, any of these things, so that they're celebrating, scrapbooking, adding the photos in there, because those are the things um, that I think that we should celebrate. And my nursery coordinator, um, she became my preschool coordinator, and all through those years, she kept the certificates, and she lined the wall right at their level and so every time they got one in chronological order she's framed these things so when i go to her house she's like okay and this is when they got their first bible and this is when they and the kids can tell me do you see pastor Trina? i got a new certificate on the wall i'm like way to go she goes i had to start cycling them through she said you know to get them down the wall and she goes and i'm going to put them in a spiral book and lam laminate them and put them in a spiral book so that they can always remember we celebrate when they lo lose their tooth for first tooth or their haircut, but do we celebrate those spiritual milestones for them? So often children, children love their work displayed, so let's display them. Spiritual formation milestones that need to be celebrated, um, and the parents got excited about this, so they'll take a stack of the things. I put them at every kid check. I put them at the nursery counter, the preschool counter, and that way they can just, on Sunday morning, oh, Pastor, during this week, my child for the first time shared their story with someone else and invited them to church. Boom, done. Any kind of spiritual thing that, that their parents want to celebrate, I'm all for it. I'm like, yes, they memorized their first verse. They memorized the first chapter. I've signed off on all sorts of things. Anything that's celebrating their spiritual growth, I'm all for it. So in your notes, you'll see a list of some things that um, I put in there. So along in nursery, um, their childhood milestones is what I call them. So in nursery time, when they're little, well, what can we celebrate there? The first time they fold their hands and pray over their snack. In nursery, I've signed that certificate. And they prayed for themselves. Jesus, thank you for my food done i'm signing that man i'm celebrating it parents are all excited they prayed <laughs> you know? and, and my workers also give certificates if they see something so i'll sign one and um if parents alert me or if a, of a, of a teacher comes up to me i'm like oh yeah give them that that's awesome they invited the five neighbors and they came we're celebrating you have the gift of evangelism and you invited five friends on this day and I'll just fill it out for that. I just think it's really important. Um, so during their nursery time, we do things like when they praise the Lord or raise their hand or, I mean, just all, and it, you think it sounds petty, but the truth is, is that parents get all excited about little things. If they're going to go try to catch Pokemon out in a parking lot somewhere, they can do this. This is, this is awesome and even more exciting for parents. Um, early childhood, uh, when they buy their first Bible, when they read their first story, when they can repeat it back. So we bought the rhyming bio for our kids. Who is big and mean and strong? A giant named Goliath. You come to me with a spear and the sword. I come to you. Oh, my kids would quote. I read, I read that book 100,000 times. And when we got to the end of the book, Jonathan, my oldest, said, can we just date it? Mom, I'm done with that one. <laughs> Let's move on. So I date when they started reading the Bible when I bought it, and I date the back of the Bible. And now my children on their bookshelves, they'll throw all their other books away. They have the Bibles that they started, and they've dated them when they started reading them, and then when they were done reading them. <laughs> like, Michael's in 11th grade. He's still reading the Action Bible. Just so you know, <laughs> it's the comic book Bible. He loves it. And he's like, Mom, just don't put that away off the shelf. Okay. Let you read that one. He just kind of left light reading, I think, for him. So uh, celebrate those milestones of when they buy a Bible or when they've read it or when they've memorized uh, something for that. Um, and I also, in elementary, of course, those are some bigger, bigger milestones, I think, that happen in elementary um, to be celebrated. Um, this is when kids really learn and grow in a deeper walk with the Lord. Um, and so there's the assurance of salvation. Maybe they raise their hand. Maybe God called them into missions. Oh, that's a big milestone. Let's write that down. So many times, I don't even know. I don't even remember now what age or. I remember I was at camp, Cedar Springs camp, when God called me into ministry and missions. I remember kind of being. I remember the kind of the year. I think it was that same year or the year before that I was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Um, but I don't have dates or times or anything, but wouldn't it have been cool? Not that that's relevant, but that I went home and told my mom and we filled it out and put it in a journal. And I remembered when I had that milestone because when they look back, what are milestones for? In the Bible, God would say, build a bunch of rocks and put it right stinking in the middle of the river because I allowed you to cross on Gryland. Build a big old bunch of rocks right here because when you come around the loop and you see that, you're going to remember that I provided for you, that I did this for you. If kids build milestones, big markers along the way, and when they come around, and it's, they're going to go, oh, I remember what God did. Milestones are to help them to remember what God did in their lives. If we can make milestones a big part of kids' lives, but who's to remind them of their milestones? The parents. So get the parents lit on fire and excite them um, and be the biggest cheerleader of helping them to celebrate the wins and milestones in their kids' lives. When they go to camp, when they go to um, uh, Nitro and, they bought, and three ki- of their friends came to know Jesus, I mean, I just like, I would just celebrate. Every th- we, we don't celebrate those enough. And we wonder why kids are like, not very excited about church because they're not looking forward to something like oh because kids love to earn stuff and the truth is is we're not giving them money we're not giving them prestige or anything like that we're celebrating spiritual growth and i believe that kids get excited about that um, when they first volunteer so everywhere between kindergarten and fifth grade they're like i want to serve jesus i'm so tired of going to church like i have a little kindergarten hannah she's for example when can I be baptized? <laughs> she's like, when can I serve on the worship team? Like, she's so excited about serving the Lord. She wants to volunteer. So I think we need to celebrate those milestones. And the last um, is faith-building connections between home and church. So there are some specific things that the church does provide, which are the ordinances of the church. So how do we handle communion, <coughs> water baptism, um, child dedication, and I just want to share a little story of what we do at NFC. Um, it's just really a, a something that I've learned out of experience. Um, and I want to encourage you to have a system in place where you faithfully have child dedications, not just on Mother's Day, but that you have them on a periodic, it's like they're on the calendar, because those are milestone moments for parents. And it also helps capture them in the spiritual growth of their kids. And I think not just the senior pastor should be a part of it, if there's a children's leader or a children's pastor, you should be a part of the child's dedication because you're saying kids matter and I want to be here right from the start. So I think you should be the persons to actually lead a class for child dedication that they have to go through. Wouldn't it be awesome for that? Handing them their book, shepherding a child's heart, praying over them, and then on a Sunday morning, it's the formal ceremony of it. Um, I really like uh, city churches um, with Judah Smith and what they do there. They have a great system in place for child dedication. It was like this manual. And, I just, and then they, there's Baby D, um, a, a curriculum you can buy from the um, Andy Stanley's church. I mean, I went all, I looked at all this stuff, and I just kept it really simple. <laughs> and I just said, a little class that tells them you're the spiritual parents of your kids. The responsibility is on you. And I kind of do the parent preview kind of personally one-on-one for all the parent uh, for child dedication and then let them know how valuable their role is as parents. So dedication, offer often, put it on the calendar. Water baptism, we baptize kids. I make a recommended age at seven and I kind of hold to it. Um, Hannah's five, she's just, she's like a five-year-old in a 16-year-old mind kind of thing. She can communicate at an adult level because she's all around adults. Um, I am using her just because she's really <laughs> recent in my life. But some kids at age five, my kids both at age five said, Mom, I'm ready. I, I just, please, can I be baptized? Like I knew my kids knew the Lord and wanted to be baptized. I think five is when they really ground. Remember everything I learned, I learned by kindergarten. That's when they, they connect the dots. I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Um, and so I believe somewhere between five and seven is the earliest that they would understand it because what you don't want to do is baptize kids and then they come around at 16. I don't remember it or it didn't mean anything to me. So we really want it to be meaningful. So we offer a class and the parents have to attend it. And um, I recommend seven and older. We do it every other month. We teach the class the week before and then we come back and that gives me the ability to say no, right, to the parents. And so how I do it, the kids are all in the class and everything. And if the kids are like, and they don't fill it out. They're not answering the questions. I'll just 
as the parents are leaving, I'll just step aside and say, you know what, I just really don't think John's ready um, right now. He's really not engaged in it. it doesn't, it's not going to mean anything to him. So I let them know it's not going to mean anything to him, and he'll end up being baptized again. So why don't you wait for a while, maybe in uh, you know, six months, another year, and, and you can come to attend the class again when he is, his heart is ready and he really wants to take that next step. So I kind of do that. I do a coaching moment. Um, I've called parents later when we've had too big of a class. And I just said, hey, I've reviewed their application. Like, they don't have any of the right answers because they have a little, an they have to tell me their personal salvation story. And if they can't articulate it, have no interest, sometimes it's parents pushing them to get done. I've seen that too. Where parents, well, he's getting baptized next week. And I have to hold my hand up and say, you know what, uh, me and the pastoral staff, so pastor told me, <laughs> just put us all in there. Give us power to that. He said, me and the pastoral staff at this time are not recommending him to be baptized at this time. And so we're going to tell you a firm no. Like I've had to even have that conversation. It's rare. But I've had to say, I want them to wait because I want it to be memorable. And I want it to make a difference in their life. And at this time, it would just be getting wet. And I have not had actually any, any uh, pushback from that. And then communion is the last one. Never serve communion <laughs> without letting parents know. This is a big one for some parents. Um, they really don't want to be surprised with this one. And I don't know why, you know, like, and baptism too, like at camp. Um, often we have the youth pastor calling parents saying, hey, your child's here. They're going to do a baptism service. Want to let ask if that's okay. I think that's a great, smart response. Always let parents be a part of it. They, they're going to want to miss that spiritual milestone, and I don't want them to miss it. Um, so also the other thing is, is that I don't, I don't, I don't ever do, give communion kids church, but I will teach about it heavily teach about it. I'll, I'll teach the ordinances of the church um, and encourage them next with you're sitting with your mom and dad in, in the main service, ask them if you can partake with it. Because I really want to have an interaction with the parent because the parent's going to know the child's heart and where they're at um, and on communion. So that's a little tidbit on there. I do encourage that. Um, and I, I want to um, just draw to the very end here some, some questions. No, we don't have a lot of time, but I want to give it food for thought. Um, and I want, um, I want it to be um, that you would answer these questions maybe for, for your, if you're the leader, maybe you can make the decision, or if you have a team, include them in on the process of answering these questions. So I'm going to throw them out here um, due to time, but I want to have you think about them just for a minute. So question number one, to help parents be more involved in the Christian education or spiritual formation of their kids, how can your church or children's team design your program to include the parents. So in what ways do you include parents? Um, um, we, we started a thing called parent uh, partnership. We did a parent partnering where we invited parents to serve in any area of the ministry. They didn't have to serve. A lot of times when they have toddlers, they don't want to serve in the, <laughs> the class that their kid's in. I said, just serve anywhere. You can serve on Wednesday, Sunday. Just serve in one way, once a month, once a month. The team got really big. People were serving one time a month. It made such a big difference in the team. Um, and then guess what else happened? They got to see what was happening in children's ministry. So they're like, well, this is pretty cool. This is what you're doing. Invite them to Nitro camps, large events, all of your outreach events. Include them on your teams. The best place I've ever recruited was by inviting them to an event. And they're like, this is how children's ministry is. This is so cool. I want, can, I do, can I be a part of this? And then I start them off in baby steps. I've recruited more people that way by inviting them to events and to participate in um, children's ministries in some function, whether it would be an outreach, an event, um, district event, doesn't matter, whatever it was. Then they get to see what children's ministries and how fun it is and the reward of kids getting saved. So how do you include parents? Second, how can you be intentional about communicating and partnering with parents? Um, remember, communicating before the event happens. Um, communicating before uh, the lessons are going out. Oftentimes, take-home papers or to follow up what you taught. Wouldn't it be better if this parent already had the content ahead of time and saying, hey, over the next two weeks, you're going to be learning about finance. It's now all of a sudden shifting the role to the parent, and now the parent feels empowered. The parent's going to be much more, instead of, surprise, this is what we learned today, I felt when I was talking to parents, that's how they felt about take-home papers, and that's why they would toss them, because they felt lesser of the lower, they didn't feel like they were the educator spiritually. So how can I, and it might be just semantics, you know, where I'm switching it around, but if you do it beforehand, now the parents have a say. They have a voice, they have the ability. Even if they don't all take it, 
they now feel more like, oh, they're including me in on the, the no. I know what's coming. Um, and I think that's really important. So how can you be more intentional? Whether it be calendar planning, do you print off, I print off the full calendar and I tell them it's all in pencil, but this is an idea of what children's ministries look like. And they're like, so I, I have a copy of my calendar back there. It's not exhaustive, but it was what I handed out the last parent meeting. And it changes, you know, like, oh, we're not going to do that event. We're going to put that in there. And parents aren't, don't freak out about that, except for the big things, you know, like camp, don't move camp, because camp can't, can't be moved. Anyway, but uh, just communicate to them the schedule. And here's my third question. What ideas can I present or bring up to my children's ministry team to take, um, to offer parents guidance, tools, training helps? Can I bring in an awesome teaching series and be intentional? Once a year, we're going to offer a parenting um, seminar. Once a year, or three times a year, we're going to offer parent preview. What in, how have you intentionalized equipping parents? Because they really need it. And then stink and love on them. Love on those parents. Tell them what a wonderful job they're doing. And they, they, I will guarantee it, most parents think they're doing a horrible job. There are a few that are, comp like, they have insecurities too. Parents do too. And they, they just want to know, okay, like, well, you, that's your job. A lot of times we see that, right? They say, that's your job, to, and then I'll just follow up. How do we role reversal that? By praising them as the spiritual leaders. So I think that we need to be more intentional and not say the no or the excuse for them, but to lead them on and expect more out of our parents. So what tools do you give them? What's on the calendar for parents? Um, it doesn't have to be busy. I'm not talking about busy work. I'm talking about intentionally planning to empower them to spiritually lead their kids. Barna offers spiritual um, what is it, spiritual formation of kids. He actually offers a class and a track for spiritually parenting. Parenti I think it's called spiritual parenting. He has a booklet that I've read through. I'm like, ooh, that would be really really. There's tons to choose from. Dobson has stuff. Find something and offer it to parents, and then make it easy. Provide provide ministry for their kids, invest in them, have food, just do whatever it is to build community, and then have them sit with like age group kids. This is something else I found. So everybody who's got a nursery kid over here, everybody's got a preschool kid over here, everybody's got an elementary kid, because then now all of a sudden they have the ability to communicate at their same level. Yeah, my kid does this. And what do you do about that? And they really need that. So Partnering with parents in the spiritual growth of their children is the most challenging but the most rewarding. Seeing parents encourage and lead their children to experience all God has for them is the most fulfilling thing in my, in my ministry career. It's not about what I taught them. It's what about how their parents did and led them to Jesus. I want to hear more stories about parents leading their kids to the Lord than me having them raise their hands. Even though that's a tool that I use, you know, we all do, I really want parents to be a part seeing their child read their first Bible, memorize their first scripture, be baptized. How many of you get the chance to baptize kids? That, I'm always in the tank. <laughs> in fact, my goal is that they're all baptized before they leave fifth grade. That's my goal. In fact, I hound after the fifth graders. I go after the fourth and fifth graders every time there's baptism. I teach about it. I hound them. I say, you're ready for that next step. John, you're not going to leave until you, you, you need baptism, you know. I'm praying for them. I'm wanting them to experience all God has for them. So that's all we have for this session. I know we've got to get upstairs. Our time is uh, tight. But if you have any questions, I'm just going to hang out at the back. Please feel free to take any of those take-home things. The magnet, there's a little stack back there of the milestone markers, like giving parents ideas. It's not exhaustive. And I put a magnet on it. And parents have been putting it on the refrigerator. And I'm like, oh, yeah, because it's a reminder to them. I need to be about the spiritual milestones of my kids. I got my business card back there. I'd love to be able to connect with you, empower you. Uh, I'd mail you everything on a key drive or Dropbox or Basecamp or whatever you got. I, I'd send you anything I have, um, any of the tools, because, of course, these are hard tools. And then I have some copies of things that I gave at the last parent meeting. So I gave them a teaching tool. So I gave them the lead them. And I gave them something for preschool parents um, or parents of, ki excuse me, parents of kids um, of what to do when your child comes home from school and they won't talk. Um, I gave them a little, a little, some little tools. And I think the parents are like, oh, there's a tool. Like they need tools in their toolbox to feel successful. And then cheer, cheerlead them on. I believe in you. Let's go. We have another, <laughs> another, another main session. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.